Welcome to the HP PalmTop Tube channel. Today we're going to see if it's possible to run a more advanced operating system on the HP 100 or 200 LX machines than the MS-DOS 5.0 that comes installed on ROM in these platforms. My final goal is to try and create a robust web server from a 200 LX palm top over the course of this video and the second video which I will release in a few weeks containing part 2 and have it serve a website 24-7 indefinitely containing HP palm top tools and programs for download. I used to be a Unix systems administrator and later a Linux administrator and engineer for about a decade from around 1995 until 2005 and while it's been a while since I've been used Linux for more than a simple home Samba and NFS server I'm ready to see if there was any way of running a Unix like operating system on this palm top. Since a robust web server requires an operating system with a good TCP IP stack implementation, process management, especially if multiple users are browsing the web server concurrently, as our operating system won't be able to use threads, so we will have to fork processes whenever somebody uh, reads a web page. A Unix like operating system would be ideal for a web server. However, since a more complex preemptive multitasking multi-user operating system like Linux or any other Unix-like operating system requires at least a 386 CPU due to the need for its protected mode features and the memory management unit for paging and virtual memory support, alongside being able to address at least a few megabytes of RAM, the 200 LX's 8186 CPU with only 640 kilobytes of RAM is simply unable to run any version of Linux or any other Unix-like operating system available today. So the next possible solution I looked at was the ELKS project, short for Embeddable Linux Kernel Subset, formerly known as Linux 8086 which is a small Linux-like operating system which uses a small subset of older Linux kernel code, but there were a few problems that prevented me from using ELKS. Because the palm top lacks the BIOS in 13H hard drive and floppy drive services, which ELKS needs to boot up, it won't run on the 200LX. Also, ELKS is not very complete, it's old, it lacks many essential features I need and seems to have been somewhat abandoned with the last project activity being many years ago. After looking around for other possible solutions like Microsoft Xenix for 8086 CPUs from the 80s, which also wouldn't run for the same reasons as ELKS wouldn't be able to boot, and I wasn't able to find any images of Xenix installation media online. So finally, I decided to check out Minix, a small Unix-like operating system, initially developed for educational purposes, and for the same reason as ELKS and Xenix, it won't work on the 200LX. But I did manage to find a version of Minix 2.0 called DOS Minix 2.0 with a few patches to make it able to run on the HP 200LX. So what is Minix? Minix has been around for a long long time. It's older than Linux and actually is somewhat responsible for Linus Torvalds development of Linux. Back in 1987 a book was released called Operating Systems Design and Implementation written by Andrew S. Tannenbaum, an American Dutch computer scientist and professor emeritus of computer science at the Vrije Universiteit in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. He is the father of Minix. The 719 page book teaches the reader how to develop a modern Unix-like kernel and operating system. The book came with a copy of the source code discussed in the book, which was Minix version 1. In 1997, 
the second edition was published and came with an open source copy of Minix 2.0, the version which we will be using in this video. While Minix version 1 was quite a simple system lacking many features we take for granted nowadays, Minix 2.0 contained a lot of changes and new features including a user space TCP IP stack. It's actually a fairly complete and usable Unix-like operating system with a good C compiler, full kernel sources to compile your custom kernel and all other typical Unix command line tools you use in Linux and other Unix and Unix-like operating systems, albeit older versions and it lacks a few modern commands. Linus Torvald studied this book and developed the very first versions of his Linux kernel based on many of the concepts in the book and the Minix source code. In fact, the famous newsgroup announcement in August of 1991 of Linus Torvalds announcing his new operating system to the world mentions Minix several times. Hello everybody out there using Minix. I'm doing a free operating system, just a hobby, won't be big and professional like GNU, for 386 and 486 AT clones. This has been brewing since April and is starting to get ready. I'd like any feedback on things people like and dislike in Minix, as my OS resembles it somewhat. Same physical layout of the file system, due to practical reasons, among other things. So he goes on, uh, you can read it on the screen about how he ported Bash and GCC. And he says, yes, it's free of any Minix code. So he did not actually copy code from the Minix project, he wrote it all himself. Um, so the main differences between Linux and Minix is that Linux uses a monolithic kernel, well at least at the time, which is a kernel that implements all its drivers and subsystems compiled into the kernel and they're all running in kernel space. While Minix uses a microkernel, which only contains the necessary low-level subsystems in the kernel and leaves most drivers and services to run in user space on top of the kernel. The macOS X earlier versions also ran on a microkernel, by the way. Both monolithic and microkernel based operating systems have their advantages and disadvantages. The first versions of Linux also used Minix file system as their native and only file system, long before Linux file systems like ext2 and ext3 came along. So to get our Minix 2.0 running on the 200LX, we need to use the 200LX patched 16-bit x86 version of DOS Minix 2.0, which is a version of Minix that is booted from MS-DOS much like Novell Netware 3 and earlier booted from MS-DOS as well. The Minix bootloader called Monitor is a DOS program that will configure the memory of the system, mount the root file system from a disk image file called minix.mnx, sets kernel variables and boots the kernel. Most of MS-DOS is removed from memory by the monitor and the DOS Minix kernel only uses the remaining MS-DOS parts in memory that allow it to read and write to its disk image file or files on the DOS file system. Since most of MS-DOS is removed from memory, you cannot exit Minix and return to MS-DOS. If you shut down or reboot your Minix system, you have to reboot the system and load MS-DOS again. As you will see in this video, there's a fair bit of work involved to set up a properly configured Minix 2.0 system with a large file system and a means of transferring downloaded files to it. Okay, let's get started. So I've uh, got a stock 2 megabyte 200 LX. Um, which has been upgraded with a double speed crystal, which as you'll see later on is quite handy when running a heavy operating system like Minix. Um, and I've booted it using the minimal amount of necessary drivers in my config sys for me to be able to access the files 
So I'm using a 2 gigabyte compact flash card in a CF to PCMCIA converter inserted into the palm top and I have loaded the ClockUp32 sys driver in the config sys file for the double speed upgrade and the ACE card 3 driver that enables me to read large compact flash cards like the 2 gigabyte one I have inserted. Then I have on my uh, desktop PC with a USB multi-card reader, I have copied the DOS Minix distribution files, which is just a few files, into a directory called Minix20. And we're going to go in there now and I'm going to show you how to start DOS Minix. So let's go to the A drive and in the directory Minix20 you will see the files here. So the first one is boot.com, which is the uh, Minix boot monitor, which is basically a tool that allows you to bootstrap the kernel and start it. Uh, you can also set uh, environment variables for your kernel uh, or launch uh, your Minix with a different kernel, like one that you just compiled and that you'd like to test. Um, the second file is minix.ico, uh, it's just an icon um, for minix. Then we have minix.mnx, which is a nearly 42 megabyte file. Uh, this is basically our base system. So this mnx file is an image of a drive that is partitioned with two minix type partitions and each of those two partitions is formatted. Well, a file system has been made on it uh, of the type Minix version 2 slash old Linux, which is something that we'll go into detail in a little bit later. And basically the first file system in there is the root file system, which is the size of a high density uh, three and a half inch floppy or 1.4 megabytes, which contains the system root, um, the kernel image, and the necessary bootstrap files to boot up the system. The remaining part of this 42 megabyte file is a 40 megabyte slash user file system, which contains a base Minix system. Uh, it contains all the necessary binaries for systems administration tasks, it contains editors, it contains all kinds of commands that, um, are, that you need on a Unix system. It also contains libraries, C libraries. It also contains source code for most of the tools on the system, as well as the complete source code for the kernel. Back in those days, you didn't have the luxuries of um, driver modules and such, so you had to build your own kernel uh, to suit your configuration. Um, and so those two Minix file systems are in this partition drive, which is inside this MNX file. So let's go ahead and boot it. So we just launched the boot monitor and we give it as an option the file Minix dot mnx and it will find the file and it's possible here to hit escape and start making changes to your boot environment but that is not necessary by default it will just do a normal boot so all you have to do is just press the equal sign to start minix and as you can see now the kernel is starting we have 600 megabytes of memory that the boot monitor could grab uh, from DOS. It tries to allocate as much as it can. Um, it's not 640 because, you know, I do have some drivers from my configs that I need for the compact flash card. The kernel itself is 182 kilobytes and so we have about nearly 420 kilobytes of user land memory left to work with. It's not a lot but as you'll see you can still do quite a bit with it. Um, okay, so the kernel here that we've booted is the standard 
simple kernel that comes with the distribution. It uh, is a, a generic kernel. It does not have any networking code built in. Um, and I will show you later on in the configuration for the kernel sources uh, what is in that kernel and how we can change those things and build a new kernel. So like every Unix system it has no name because it's brand new and uh, it asks for a login. So um, we're gonna log in as root which by default has no password and there you go. Um, it launches the shell. Now the shell that it uses is you don't have the luxury of, of the born again shell bash that everybody's using in Linux nowadays. It's too large and too slow for such a small system. So we use a born shell like shell, not a C shell called ash, A-S-H, which is much smaller and quite a bit simpler uh, and quite old fashioned. And it is basically um, a very uh, nearly identical clone of the default shell or a shell that came with Unix, AT&T Unix System 5, the original Unix distributions from AT&T. Um, although the operating system itself has many BSD extensions and modifications, for example, the systems in it is a BSD in it, not a System 5 in it. But we'll show all that later on. So our system, uh, let's have a look at our disks. If uh, we do DF, we can see our hard drives. Well, hard drives are DOS D1 and DOS D2, which are DOS file type drives. And as you can see, the first one is 1.4 megabytes and the second one is 39 megabytes. And um, on the first one, we have about 600 or how much? Yep, uh, kilobytes free. And the 40 megabyte user image is approximately half full, just a little bit under half full, about 19, nearly 20 megabytes of disk space remaining. So that is how you start the system and you log in. Um, so what we're going to do next is we're going to need a way to transfer files from and to our Minix system uh, in a comfortable and convenient way. And we also want more disk space because with 20 megabytes of disk space, you know, you're not going to be able to do much. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a modern Linux machine which can read and write and create Minix file systems because the Minix file system used to be Linux's default file system in the very early stages of Linux development um, and so we're going to use a modern Linux machine to create an another MNX image file uh, which is going to contain a 100 megabyte file system and we're going to load uh, a whole bunch of software on there that I've already downloaded online from the Minix2 website, um, which contains a whole variety of compilable uh, sources for all kinds of uh, servers, server daemons like a web server, an FTP server. It contains code for point-to-point -point protocol and slip protocol over your serial line for internet connectivity. Uh, it contains all kinds of editors, it contains links, the text-based web browser and many other things. So let's do that now. Okay, so I have a Linux system, modern Linux system, it's uh, Debian based and um, I don't need to install any tools or anything, uh, everything that we need comes with the system by default. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to create a 100 megabyte file first. So we use DD uh, and we're going to write the zeros to a file uh, that we're going to call export.mnx in capitals. And the block size is going to be one megabyte 
and count is 100. Okay, so if we look at this file now, we can see that we've created a file full of zeros, which is approximately 100 megabytes in size. It's 105, but due to file system stuff, you'll see it's, it's gonna be just under 100 megabyte in the end. Um, so when that's done, we are going to uh, use the FDisk tool. So FDisk on Linux is quite a bit more complex than a suitable uh, tool like it, like FDisk on DOS. Uh, it has many options and it supports an enormous amount of, of partition types. So instead of using FDisk on a, a block device file like a hard drive or a floppy drive, we can just use it directly on export MNX our disk image file. And if we type P, we can see that, you know, it's 100 megabytes and it's completely empty. Um, so the first command we are going to do um, is um, the O command, which basically tells it that this is to be a DOS image. Uh, it puts a DOS disk label uh, at the beginning of the image uh, to make it a DOS drive image. Uh, once we've done that, we do N for a new partition. We're just going to create one primary partition, number one. And we just use the defaults here, which will give us the maximum size. And it has now created one partition of type Linux of 99 megabytes. Now, we need to change this because the Linux type won't work with Minix. Minix has been around before Linux was around. So it definitely doesn't know what Linux is. Uh, so for that, uh, what we do is we use the T command. We select partition one and we, I'm just gonna type L here to give you a list of all the types that are supported. Um, what we need is type 81, which is the top one in the third column. Minix slash old Linux, it's called type 81 which is the partition type for a Minix uh, to one or two uh, file system. The reason why it's called slash old Linux is because, as I said before, the older versions, the very first versions of Linux used the Minix file system as its default file system and only file system supported. So we type 81. So our partition type is now changed to Minix slash old Linux. Um, when we're done with that, uh, we are going to set the bootable flag on the partition. Now, why am I doing this? I don't know. We're not going to boot from this partition, uh, but it seems that if you don't set this bootable flag that the uh, Minix boot monitor doesn't want to recognize it. So I need to enable it with typing P. And as you can see here, uh, our uh, disk image contains one partition called export.mnx1 with the little star under boot indicating that it is bootable and it's 99 megabytes and it is type id 81 minix slash old linux so basically um, now we are done uh, so the last thing we do is we type the w command to write our new partition table to the disks and it will automatically exit fdisk and now if we do for example fdisk-lu which shows the contents of uh, a partition drive or an image uh, export.mnx you can see that our file contains our proper partition uh, of type minix now the next thing we need to do is we need to make a Minix version 2 file system on that export.mnx1 partition and I, uh, Linux is perfectly capable of doing this. There is an mkfs.minix 
command that allows you to create Linux version 1, 2 and 3 file systems. But there is something that I'm missing. I've tried so many different things. Uh, I've tried version 1, version 2, I've tried changing the max name lengths, I've tried different uh, inodes. I mean, it, I simply cannot get the DOS Minix on the palm top to recognize it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop here on Linux. I'm going to copy this image file that we've just created uh, back to my compact flashcard. And we're going to go to the palm top and we're going to use the palm top and DOS Minix to mount this uh, partition and then make a file system on it and then mount it. And that way um, the DOS Linux will be able to read uh, and use that file system because it it's made with the actual Minix make file system tool on the Minix distribution on the palm top. So back to the palm top for now. Well, we're back on our palm top. As you can see, I have copied the export.mnx file into our Minix directory here. Uh, the file that we just created on the Linux uh, system. And we're going to again boot Minix mnx but instead of choosing the equal uh, key to just continue we're going to press escape so that we can define a variable to add that extra minix image that we created and to do that we just need to define a dos drive file uh, dos d5 equals and then just the name of the image export dot mnx and then we just type boot and now it should recognize that file and add it so if we log in We should be able to, so MKFS is the uh, Minix tool to make a Minix file system. Minix can only make Minix file systems, it doesn't have multiple ones like Linux has. Um, and since we defined our image in the monitor, the boot monitor as DOSD5, it will actually be called DOSD6 because we start from 1, not 0, uh, when we're inside the OS. So um, what I'm going to do is mkfs slash dev slash dos d6 uh, And that is now writing out the file system inodes. And um, there, that's finished. All good. Um, we can try and mount this empty file system. Um, I have a directory called export in the root. If you don't have it, just uh, mkvir slash export will make it but I've already got it so I can just mount slash dev slash dos d6 in slash export so it says it's mounted in read write mode so if we now go into slash export it will be empty so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to touch test.txt which is just going to create a little empty file on it and if we do the df command disk free we can see now that the last one here the dosd6 device file uh, it's 100 megabytes in size 
and it's basically empty and it's mounted in slash export so we now have a working 100 megabyte Minix file system in the image file so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna unmount it well I don't even have to unmount it I'm just gonna shut down the system which will automatically unmount all mounted file systems and for the last time we are going to copy the file back onto our Linux machine so we can copy uh, all our downloaded data into it and have it available uh, when we put it back in the palm top. So back to our Linux machine. Okay so we're back on the same Linux machine. I've copied the export.mnx file back onto the Linux machine and slash export and now we're going to mount the first partition inside of it the Minix file system in a directory called slash ex. So to do that because we don't have a file system, a raw file system in the image file. We actually have a partition file. We need to get that partition out. So we do that with the loop zero device and there is a tool to configure it called low setup. And if you do dash dash part scan dash dash show dash dash find and then export the MNX our image file it will create this uh, loop zero device and if you uh, were to do fdisk dash ul slash dev slash loop zero you can print it and see that the uh, loop zero p1 is our Minix file system so we can just use our mount command uh, and Linux will automatically detect that it's a Minix file system and mount it so you don't need to specify it with the minus T option unless you really want to. Uh, but I'm just going to mount slash dev slash loop 0 P1 in my mount point which is slash EX. And now if we type mount you can see in the bottom that it's correctly mounted. If we uh, do a df minus k, we can see 99,000 kilobytes, 99 megabytes uh, mounted on slash ex. And if we go to slash ex, we can see our little test.txt that we touched into it on the palm top. I'm gonna remove that because I don't need that. Um, I have a what was it called again? Uh, X files. I will go over this a little bit later on, but X files here is about 30 megabytes of files. Um, it contains Contrib, which is contribution software from the Minix 2 website. Um, it contains all kinds of useful tools, all in source code. We have to compile these if we want to use them. Uh, it contains some network card drivers, an FTP server, PPP and slip uh, tools, um, some editors, um, some s uh, secure tunneling, uh, telnet, daemon, uh, even a web server, HTTPD and an FTP server, uh, gzip, which for Minix was not supplied by default, it only used uh, zcat and you know dot z uh, as you can see the archives are using here so besides that we also have funnet.fi which is a quite it's been around for like 20 years an ftp site which contains a lot of files and has a minix section and i managed to find a few tools some communication tools some programming tools utilities and actually a few games as well. Now don't expect Doom or anything. It's just going to be simple text adventures, you know, antique Unix games from the late 70s uh, or mid 70s even. And um, yeah, besides that, we have Init, which contains a bunch of tools that we can use once we have our networking our TCP IP stack set up and compiled compiled into the kernel which we will be doing later on um, 
So I'm just going to copy all this to EX and our new Minix file system now contains all these files. Um, if we do a DF, you can see that we have consumed approximately 30 megabytes, nearly 30 megabytes, so a third of our file system. So we have nearly 70 megabytes free, which is more than enough free space for a small Unix system like Minix uh, to work with. So um, we're done. We can just uh, unmount our file system, remove the loop device with, I think it was minus capital D, yeah. And all that remains now is again, moving the uh, file, uh, the disk image file export.mnx. For the last time, we're moving it back to the palm top and then we're going to start using it. So back to the palm top. Okay, so I have booted up the palm top into MS-DOS. Um, I've copied the MNX file from Linux back into the same DOS Minix directory on the compact flash card. And we're now going to use it. Uh, first, what I'm going to do is with the built-in text editor, I'm going to just open the autoexec.bat and I'm going to go to the end and enable uh, automatic startup of Minix so we don't need to type that boot monitor command every time we start the system there. So now if we reboot we will be going directly into the Minix boot monitor. There we go. And what we want to do is we want to have boot automatically uh, bind that export.mnx file uh, to the kernel so the kernel can mount it later um, when the system has uh, started out. So what we're going to do is in the monitor, we hit escape so we can uh, go into a, the interactive monitor. We're going to set the variable DOS D5 equals export dot mnx. And we're going to type save so that this will be written to the first few sectors of the uh, first MNX file uh, which contains the root file system and from now on every time we start the boot monitor this variable will already be declared. So now we can just boot. The system is going to start up and the DOS D, uh, that DOS disk export.mnx will be available. It's not going to be mounted or anything because we need to do that manually. So now that we've started up, let's log in as root. And um, I think I already have the export directory in the root. Yep, there it is. So it's an empty directory slash export where I'll be mounting the file system in. So we just do mount slash dev slash dos d6 not five because under the operating system we start from one not zero and then we just mount that on slash export and there you go it's detected it and it's mounted it in read write mode on slash export so if we look at it we can see all the files the directories with the files that we copied onto it from linux and if we do a df you can see on the last line that the um, file system is mounted on slash export of about 70 megabytes free on it and about 30 megabytes is used. So having that done we want to automate all this so we don't need to manually keep mounting it every time we start up. So what we're gonna do is 
we're gonna show a few things that are different in Minix than to uh, uh, more modern Linux and other Unix systems. Um, if we go to the etc directory, there is a file called fstab. Now on other Unixes and Linuxes, this is a file where you can add, you know, a number of drives to and the system will automatically mount them if necessary during boot. Now on Minix this works a little bit differently. The FS tab is actually just a little script that defines the two variables root and user. Um, it's not an FS tab file. It doesn't get parsed like an FS tab file. So if you were to add additional lines to this, nothing will happen. It just needs to know what root and user are. Um, so instead what we do is we're going to mount it manually from the RC file. Now, if you look in uh, the etc directory, there is a file called RC, which is the startup script, a little bit like an advanced version of the autoexec.bat in DOS. Now, RC is a BSD style in its system, although on Minix it's a very simple one because it's just one file. Um, so if we go down here, see I've already prepared this so I have less typing to do. There is a line here, mount dosd6 slash export, which I will now unremark. Now the problem is it's hard for me to see the cursor because with this camera set up the screen is at quite a large angle. So I'll remove that first remark there for mount and then the next if condition here basically if the system was not shut down gracefully it will do a file system check on all the file systems user and the new one that will be added and then after the FSCK is done it will mount them again so what I will do is I will try to find where my cursor is first. Yep, and I will remove that. And remove that. And that one. So now it's ready. So during boot up, we will mount export after root and user is mounted above and then you know if there was no graceful shutdown it's just gonna unmount it again fsck and then mount it again that's the way minix works so okay we can write this and now if we reboot the system it will mount our new file system automatically We just do equal because we have that variable saved in the boot monitor. There you go, it's found export.mnx and mounted it in read write. So if we log in, EF, you can see it's mounted properly, slash export. Um, so We've set that up, so let's continue with some more configuration and then we can head on to the terminal and kernel configuration file stuff later on in the video. So what I'm going to do is <clears throat> I'm going to just add a little, a little bling to the system. So if I go to my root, which is the root's home directory, uh, and I edit the dot profile, which is like the per user shell script that gets started when you launch the A shell, which is what Minix uses. I'm just going to set the prompt PS1 to static, just root at Hornet, hard coded. Now, normally you would use uh, environment variables and an echo with backticks. But there's two reasons why I'm not doing that. First is memory use. 
um, this is much more efficient otherwise every time a shell prompt is displayed it needs to run the echo command and if you're like got a lot of shells open or you've got a script with a lot of nested shells it ends up you know slowing things down and using more memory uh, second reason is that the HP 200 Alexis keyboard lacks a backtick so I can't type a backtick um, so what I'm gonna do is, is I'm just gonna do it like this hard-coded and in the second video uh, that's coming in a few weeks where I will be building a network capable kernel with a TCP IP stack and connecting the system via the serial port to by a slip to a Raspberry Pi to have internet access um, I will be able to just tell that into the system from a modern Linux machine and set this all up properly. So I'm going to do that. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to add a user account, which we will be needing a little bit later on in the video. Um, there is an add user command, although it doesn't ask you interactively all the options as it does on Linux and Unix. It's just a one-liner script, so add user, Terence, my first name, group, Terence, it will create those, and then I will want my home directory in slash home slash Terence. And it will set everything up, create my home directory, put some default files in it, like a .hlrc and a .profile. So if we switch to the Terence user, you see instead of caret, it's got the dollar, meaning that we're a user, that we're not root. And we are in our home directory. And I'm just going to vi.profile. And I'm going to, at the end, dollar append ps1 equals okay. tick um, Terence at where is he at there at Hornet space dollar I will have to use a backslash where is the backslash here backslash dollar space and then finish the tick okay and then we can just right quit exit both shells and now if I log in as Terence You can see we have Terence at Hornet Dollar and we're in an empty home directory. Well, it's not empty, it just contains all our hidden files here. Um, so that's basically it for the configuration. I'm going to leave it as it is. It's pretty usable now. We have enough room, we have a bunch of software that we can extract and compile and play with, which I'm going to demonstrate next. Um, and um, one thing which I'd like to talk about is the shell. So the system uses the A shell, which is a shell that is a little bit smaller, but essentially the same in functionality to the original SH shell that came with Unix System 5. Um, so it, this is the only shell that's available on the default Minix installation. Uh, it's a born type shell, not a C shell. Um, it is, I call it 80 or 90% bash compatible in terms of commands and scripting. Uh, it does lack a lot of interactive features that, you know, I really miss on this system, not having bash, um, like, you know, tab completion of file names or device files. Um, and you know scrolling through your shell history with the up and down key you know those are all very useful to have when you're working on a unix system via the shell 
Um, bash, unfortunately, is a little bit too large to run on this system because it would consume most of the memory. So we need to make hay with what we have, which is a shell. And once you get used to it, it's not too bad. So, okay, we're gonna leave it here uh, regarding our system configuration. And next we're going to have a look at the kernel configuration file, the build configuration file, the TTYs and the RS232 port. And we will be connecting a terminal to the system. Okay, for the last demonstration, I'm going to be connecting a terminal to the serial port of the palm top. Um, and just to illuminate that a little bit, I'm going to first show you the config.h, which is the configuration file that uh, con configures the kernel whenever you recompile it. Um, back in these days, uh, kernels had virtually all drivers and most memory and process settings all statically uh, defined in a configuration file and it was compiled into your kernel. Uh, so building a kernel was a very common thing to do back then whenever you were reconfiguring your hardware. Um, so this file, um, it lives in a directory uh, in user include this is where our kernel sources are uh, minix well the include files at least and it's called config.h and it shows you you know this kernel basically can compile without modification on all these platforms so PC Sun Atari Amiga Macintosh and for those specific platforms, it sometimes has custom definitions. Um, you can basically enable and disable most drivers, like for example, here we have the AT Winchester driver, which is, you know, a normal IDE disk. And they're still using the old Winchester name, which is pretty historic and cool. Um, so it's very good to try and disable everything that you don't need so you can try and get that kernel as compact as possible so that you have you know more memory free to work with and if you look at um, here this section this is what I was talking about earlier when I showed the slash EDC slash TTY tab file. So in our cons is set at two, which means that we have two console terminals. So with Alt F1 and Alt F2, you can switch between them. This is my second one where I've logged in. And, you know, it's handy because you can do something on one and then switch back over to the other one. So we have two of those and that is hard compiled into the kernel. So if you change that to six, then you'll be able to do Alt F1 to Alt F6 and have six consoles running. But your kernel will be larger and consume more memory. Uh, the middle one here is NRRS lines, which is number of rs232 terminal lines so that is one because our system only has one rs232 port um, and then if you set that to zero then the rs232 port will not be used for uh, connecting a terminal and logging into the system with it the last one on nrptys are the number of those pseudo terminals um, there is four so Whenever you uh, were to log in via, say, Telnet or Remote Shell or R login or Secure Shell or Secure Telnet or any of all those uh, remote login uh, facilities, you will start a pseudo terminal. And in this case, only up to four of those can be started. So only up to four people can Telnet or Secure Shell into the system. You can raise that, of course, but again, it increases the kernel size and memory usage because it has to uh, declare uh, all those 
uh, all the data necessary for those PTYs in kernel memory. So um, this is basically the file that you configure and then when you're done you build your kernel which is what I'm going to be demonstrating in the uh, in the next video in the part two of the Minix on the 200 LX video where I will be building a kernel with TCP IP networking support and I will be configuring the RS232 port to use slip or PPP um, and connect that to either a Raspberry Pi or my Linux uh, file server over a null modem RS232 serial cable so I have TCP IP on the system and then I will be building and configuring uh, the HTTPD web server and the FTP server and I will uh, be creating a Unix web server connected to the internet because I have fiber with a static IP and a domain name tied to it and I can simply have my router forward that public IP to this machine and I will add the link to the part 2 uh, video details and then viewers of the video can actually browse to the 200LX and uh, load the website that's being served on it. As long as uh, um, there won't be a situation where you have 20 or 30 people trying to do that at the same time which will probably crash the system because it'll run out of memory but if it's you know one at a time or maybe two or three tops at a time it should be able to carry that load so um, if we look at our ETC TTY tab file you can see that it is configured with STTI set TTI to a speed of 19.2 kilobaud. So all we need to do is connect a terminal to it, which I'm going to do now. And then I will return with the last part of this video where I demonstrate the terminal working with the 200LX and Minix. Okay, so this is an overview of the terminal connection. Just uh, for a change, instead of using an HP palm top, I've decided to use a Psion Series 3A palm top. These were very popular in Western Europe, especially in the UK, back during the same time when the 200LX was being sold in the mid 90s. Uh, I had one when I was a kid um, and it comes with a comms program, a serial terminal which you could use to dial into a BBS with a modem um, and in this uh, setup you can see I have it connected with a proprietary serial port cable to the three link cable which creates an RS-232 serial port which is then connected to the RS-232 serial port of the HP running Minix uh, with a gender changer and a null modem adapter. And as you can see here, the Minix login prompt appears in the terminal and works. You can use it. So we're going to go a little bit more into detail and we're actually going to use the Psion from now on to play around with Minix, compile something. Uh, and run a game. So that's gonna be fun. Let's do that. Okay, so let's uh, start up the comms application on the Psion. Um, I will have to configure it first before we can use it. So I'm going to set up our port speed to 19.2 kilobaud as configured with STTY in the ETC TTY tab on the Minix system, 8, 1 and no parity. And then the handshake we're going to change to RTS CTS hardware handshaking. And now if we press enter, 
see it works we can actually log in which is what we're going to do now we cannot log in with a root user on a terminal you can only do that on the system console for security purposes so we're just going to log in with my terence account and then we can just switch to root I need to be root because I'm going to be building and installing stuff. So let's go to our export directory where I have prepared everything. So there is an empty directory here called source. And in here we're going to uncompress one of those games that I downloaded. Now, if you look at uh, the export funnet. games you see we have these four games uh, the first one adventure is the one that I'm gonna be using so normally I would use zcat to uncompress it and then pipe that into the tar command to untar it but unfortunately the Psyon doesn't have a pipe symbol you know a little vertical line so we'll have to do it in two steps so I'm going to just copy that game into this source directory um, funnet games there it is and I'm just gonna uncompress the file takes a few seconds and there we are we have our tar file and now we can just tar xbf advent.tar got about a dozen or so C files and some text files containing the adventure data text. Um, now these are all pre-configured to be built on Minix 2.0 so we don't need to run the configure command to determine the build environment. We can just go ahead and type make. So this will basically start building our application. Uh, it's using CC, which is the System C compiler, and it's going to compile those dozen C files and then link them together into a binary. Um, it's throwing some warnings here, implicit declaration of function. Um, those aren't, aren't, any, aren't of issue, we can just ignore those warnings, they won't have any impact um, on the final binary. So this will take a few moments. Uh, so I'm just gonna cut out here and return when the build is done. Okay, so we're back. The build took approximately four to five minutes. And as you can see here on top, the last line was uh, the linking of all the compiled C files into the advent binary so if we have a look here you'll see this new binary is there advent which is our game we can now try and run that so we do that welcome to adventure okay so there we go now I've never played this game before so I really don't know how it works would you like instructions yes Okay, so somewhere nearby is Colossal Cave, where others have found fortunes in treasure and gold, etc. You're standing at the end of a road before a small brick building. Around you is a forest. A small stream flows out of the building and down a gully. Okay, we'll look at building. 
doesn't know that word. I think it probably uses shortcuts for everything. Um, maybe if I go south, maybe just press S. Oh, yeah. Okay, so it's basically trying to draw something using a bunch of terminal characters that our dumb terminal doesn't support because the Minix uh, configuration expects a terminal with a VT100 capability, but this is just a simple dumb terminal that doesn't. So yeah anyway the game works the binary is compiled i'm not going to play the whole thing now so i'm just going to i hope quit will do the job you really want to quit yes okay here we go so theoretically i don't know if it's going to work if all the directories are there as they should be but theoretically now just a make install not all games have the install make target but let's see yeah it doesn't have an install make target so what we would then do is uh, make directory user local games for example oh it already exists oh, okay I can just copy advent to user uh, local games oh and then I think you also need those text files which contain all the game data yep let's copy those over as well And in theory now, it won't be in our path, but if I exit and I just go back to my Terence user account here, currently in my home directory, and we go into user local games, we should be able to just run it as a user and there you go you can run it as a normal user instead of just root okay so quit quit you want to quit yes okay so that was a demonstration of the Psyon series 3a with its comms application uh, being a dumb terminal connected with a null modem cable to the RS-232 port of our Minix machine on the H HP 200 LX. Okay, so that was my demonstration uh, and how to of how to get Minix 2.02 uh, installed and working on the 200 LX palm top how to add an additional large file system where we can copy uh, files into that we find online like software and other things and data um, and also a short introduction on how to set up the system how to configure the RS-232 port uh, kernel wise and then in the TTY tab and how to connect via a null modem any device that is capable of being a terminal at a baud rate of 19.2 kilobaud. Um, I hope you liked the video. I really could use your help with my channel. Um, my channel is only two months old and while things are going well, um, I need more views um, and just more activity. So I'm, I'd like to ask you if you could please help me out and just subscribe to the channel, like the video and add a comment. You can ask me questions, I'll do my best uh, to answer them. 
or just make a general comment on the video um, and you know if you do subscribe to the channel don't forget to hit the bell button so you can uh, oh it switched off there the inactivity timer of the palm top is still on um, so please uh, hit that bell icon so you get notifications of my upcoming videos because I will be making a second video which will come out in a few weeks where I will be configuring this palm top with Minix uh, to connect to a Raspberry Pi or another Linux machine using SLIP or PPP point-to-point -point protocol um, and then build and install a small HTTPD daemon that turns the machine into a web server and since I have a domain name pointing to a static public IP at my house here uh, on my fiber connection I will be making available in the comments of that next video a link so that viewers of the video can click on it and surf the website served by that 200LX which I plan to keep running indefinitely without batteries and just a, a uh, wall mount adapter plugged into the power input port of the 200LX and I'll just let that run indefinitely and maybe put some files on there including the uh, complete copy of my customized DOS Minix distribution so you can just download it straight off um, my Minix palm top and then install it on your own. So thanks for watching and see you next time.